We're going to talk about the power of the rosary to change world events and to bring peace. And there are proofs that it is already happening. In other words, the rosary is changing world events. And the purpose of that is to stress to all of us here, your rosary, each one of us, is important. And Our Lady said, it is the greatest prayer that you can say to me. Now today, we are in historic times, spiritually, morally, if you want to put it that way, technologically, socially. The evil of our times is unprecedented, and the spirit of evil is infecting all segments of life. We're being alerted by the Lord and our Blessed Mother that a great purification is taking place in preparation for a glorious renewal and a wonderful second Pentecost. Now, this is to be brought about through the powerful intercession of our Blessed Mother as indicated through the messages given us by Our Lady of Fatima. Now, the prayer that she's especially asking of all of us is the Rosary. In the history of the Church, the Rosary has played an important part in preserving our Christian faith. Let's look into some historic events. October 7, 1571, in the Gulf of Lepanto, the Turkish fleet, way outnumbering the European fleet, tried to spread the religion of Islam into Europe. St. Pius V called a rosary crusade to all of Europe, and he himself led the procession in Rome, saying the litany of Our Lady and the rosary, and that day the Turks were defeated. This occasioned the institution of the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary, October 7, 1573. August 5, 1716, the Turks tried again, and they tried to enter through Hungary. They were defeated at Peter Wardine by Prince Eugene. It was the Feast of Our Lady of the Snows that day. Pope Clement XI extended the feast at that time of the Rosary as to the Universal Church. Up until that time, it was not all through the Church. From then on, so many miracles were attributed to the Rosary that Pope Leo XIII wrote not one encyclical, twelve. No Pope has ever done that much. Twelve encyclicals on the Rosary. He set aside the month of October for the special devotion to the Rosary. It was to him that we have that practice now. We owe it to him. He prepared the way for the coming apparitions in which Our Lady would urge all of us to recite the rosary every day for special intentions over the past 100 years. Now, St. Brindy de Montfort, I think most of you know him. He's one of the great saints, Marian saints. He pointed out there are a number of blessings in the rosary. He said, those who recite the rosary faithfully will be given a perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're taking all the life of Christ in the 15 mysteries, right? So then you're thinking about it constantly and you're developing that through your spiritual reading. The second is the purification of our soul, the washing away of our sins. You can't be with the Lord saying the rosary and still remain in serious sin. In other words, Our Lady and Jesus will alert us to that and give us the grace to repent. The third is victory over our enemies, especially Satan. Fourth, increased ease in the practice of virtue. Some virtues come very difficult for some of us, and at different times we're all tempted. And here, in other words, with the ease in which we can do that, that indicates there's a power in our life that doesn't come by ourselves, it's through prayer and the rosary. The next is a love for Jesus Christ. If you're with him in your rosary constantly, every day, then there is a relationship that develops. It's a love relationship. And then there's enrichment in grace and merits. None of us know how many graces come to us each day through the rosary. If we didn't say it, I think we'd find why. We'd have all kinds of difficulties developing in our life, and uh, we would find ourselves uh, being very weak in meeting those occasions and we find ourselves repenting constantly of having failed. And the Lord is saying, you're not with me, see? But if we are with him in prayer, then of course the graces are there. And the last is 
the graces we need to pay all our debts to God and our fellow men. So throughout our day, we need to honor the Lord, perform our duties. We were talking about the divine will for some time. Uh, that's what we should be doing. We do many of that by habit. You wash dishes, do laundry, like everybody else, but do you know that's God's will? But when you do it consciously, then you get merit for that. Now, in modern times, we have these developments. From Lourdes in 1958 to a town where a lady appeared called Pont Maine, 1871, our Blessed Mother has been continuously urging us to recite the rosary in all her apparitions. See, Fatima is not just new. At Fatima, she promised that through the rosary and reparation, she would bring victory and peace in our times. Now, the times, we know that, I think, are urgent. Here's what the Holy Father said on May 13, 1982, John Paul II, one year after the attempted assassination. He said, Mary's message is still more relevant than it was 65 years ago. And he added, it is still more urgent. Now, the many apparitions, miracles, signs, healings, messages given us in the last 20 years are being considered by renowned theologians and Marian writers as signs that Mary is indeed preparing us urgently for great events. Even scientists today are saying that the natural disasters, wars, strange weather patterns are historic. You heard them on TV. The tornadoes they've had, 300 miles an hour, the floods they had, the winter uh, snows, and so forth. Weather records are being broken everywhere. There has never been so many wars as now in the past 80 years. Violence in our cities and countries, family troubles of all kinds in great numbers, all this points to the truth of what Our Lady is saying, that we are, quote, at the end of an era. What we're now seeing are signs of such an era. In other words, when these things happen, world events that are beyond our control, but they do happen, in the Christian outlook, whatever happens in the world, God is aware of that. He could prevent it if he wanted to. If he doesn't, we call it his permissive will. But out of it he does bring good for those who love him. That's St. Paul. All things what? Work unto good for those who love God. See, there's your proof. All right? Now, we're being shown that God's justice is not to be ignored in the terrible injustices committed today. For example, the genocide in Yugoslavia, Russia, Africa, and other places around the world. Uh, the violence in different places, cities, abortion, terrorism, openly defying God's laws and commandments. What about these groups that are openly promoting homosexual marriages? Even aside from private revelations, religious people of all faiths have a sense of a world that is turned away from God and is flooded with evil lifestyles, but that God will soon set things straight. This is a prevailing message of Our Lady, for example, that there will be chastisements that can be modified, though, through prayer and reparation and that there will be an end of the world's miseries, and a great renewal will take place. Mary said at Fatima, In the end, Russia will be converted, and an era of peace will be granted to the world. And many believe, with Pope John Paul, that we will have, quote from his letter on the third millennium, the final coming of the kingdom of God on earth. Now, it's going to come soon. How soon? Now, December the 7th, 1974, again to Father Stefano Gobi, Mary said, At the moment of its great confusion, on the very eve of the events which will upset the faith of so many of my children, she say, On that eve, this is a sign which I will give my very self. She will show herself the sign. Now, have you remember reading anything like that? But she also gave reassurances. And here I'm quoting from Father Stefano Gobi on page 27. Both Jesus and our Blessed Mother assure today's visionaries 
that those who respond to God's call to conversion have nothing to fear. By praying and living the messages, peace will reign in their hearts. Indeed, Mary reminds us that we are God's hands in God's hands and will share in the triumph. And this is what she told Father Stefano Gobi, December 8th. These are the years when Satan is ruling as a sure victor. These are therefore also the years of my triumph. My light will become stronger and stronger the more you enter into the decisive moments of the battle. In the end, the victory will be that of your Immaculate Mother, who with her virginal foot will crush the head of the serpent, and with her hands will bind the great dragon, that he may thus be rendered powerless and no longer be able to do harm in the world. Both humanity and the Church will experience this new era, which you are now awaiting in confidence and in prayer, in suffering and in hope. For this, as a breaking dawn, you will, as of today, see my light becoming stronger and stronger until it encircles the whole earth, ready now to open itself to the new day which will begin with the triumph of my Immaculate Heart in the world. So what we have here, as through the media you become more aware of the evil and you're going to begin to think, what is going to happen to us? It's going to test your hope. Our Lady is saying, I'm going to become more evident too. God is not going to allow the devil to conquer when Our Lady said, I will triumph. So we should have that expectation. So we're challenged, each of us, in other words, to trust in God to see us through this and also to be very faithful in saying the rosary. Now, there are also messages here, our promise of Our Lady, on the, in other words, the promise of peace and a blessed life on earth. There is a priest, if you probably know of him, he's a respected theologian and a Mariologist. He said, if we consecrate ourselves to Mary's heart, there will be peace, and the chastisements of hunger, wars, and persecutions will cease. Note that the term peace, as contrasted with the three chastisements mentioned in the apparitions, takes on the full biblical sense of shalom, the Jewish word for peace a state of being of well-being in communion with God and with our brothers and sisters in which the presence of God shines through in a harmonious existence worthy of the sons and daughters of God. Today's apparitions appear to continue to re-emphasize this new perspective given at Fatima. Contemporary visionaries throughout the world cite Mary's call for prayer and conversion but they also speak of God's coming triumph and an era of peace. Now, the time of peace, in other words, and we are to act. Consecration of the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, 1984, was set up by Pope John Paul and the bishops. Lucia of Fatima said that Our Lady accepted that. But before that, Our Lady did not accept it because not all the Church was involved in diocese. Since that time, communism disintegrated and rapid changes happened. A peace process was begun to set in, but the world is still in danger of war. Most people discerning agree that what we need most now is more prayer and spiritual renewal to hasten the time of peace. To bring about this peace, the Blessed Virgin urges us to seek it through five things that she mentions in Fatima. First, conversion, meaning a renunciation of sins, our sins, and to turn our he to our Heavenly Father with love and action, not just saying, I believe, and that we do nothing. Recite the creed, Our Lady said is her favorite prayer. Then faith, to develop a deep, complete, unwavering faith in all the truths of our faith. Recite the creed of favorite prayer. Now, prayer itself, we need to pray more often and more devoutly. Pray with the heart, and that means pray with love. Uh, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to feel it whenever you pray, but in other words, you know that Our Lady loves to hear that prayer, and you do that because she loves it, and it's your way of showing that. Also, prayerful reading of Scripture, group prayer, 
especially the Mass and Communion. And she said everyone must especially pray the Rosary daily. The next condition, peace. If we faithfully perform the above conditions, there will be peace. And the final request, condition, fasting. She reminds us that self-denial, sacrifice, are what we call reparation. They make us holy and bring special graces from God. She, is, she especially asks to fast twice a week where possible, Wednesday and Friday. Now, not everybody can do that, but also to think in these terms. She was quoted as saying on bread and water. Not everybody can do that. And even very perceptive theologians like René Laurentin, he's one of the foremost Mariologists, said that elderly people could add fruit and some other uh, uh, fruits to that kind of diet. But bread and water becomes very difficult for some of them. And uh, But some said, I can't fast on bread and water, so I don't fast at all. Wrong. There are different kinds of fasts. Fast from desserts. Fast from solid foods. Have soup. Have milk. Have different additions to it that are what we call liquid. A liquid diet. So we shouldn't easily absolve ourselves from all fasts. But I pass this on to you as a way of doing some fast, but not necessarily on bread and water. Now, why these requests? Our Lady says to prevent the annihilation of nations, which she mentioned at Fano, July 13, 1917. Our Lady's solution to this was, was these words. To prevent this, namely the annihilation of nations, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and a communion of reparation on the first Saturdays, five Saturdays. Okay? Now, although communism has disintegrated in Russia, Russia is not completely converted. Conversion has begun. A return to God is taking place. But we do also have this, though, that when we do have the new Pentecost, there will be one church. See? Now, in Akita, Japan, October 13, 1973, notice that's the anniversary of the miracle of the sun at Fatima. Mary said that that happened, those 70,000 people, so that all may believe. And that was given to Sister Agnes at Akita. The following message was given here too. She told Sister Agnes, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity. I alone can still save you from the calamities which approach. Now, two months before, on August 6, 1973, the anniversary date of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, Mary warned Sister Agnes a great chastisement for all mankind. Now, Our Lady asked three things in Fatima. Pray the Rosary, wear the scapular, and third, communion and reparation on first Saturday of each month, including confession. But now, one author, and he's very well known, he's the co-founder of the Blue Army, John Haffert, said chastisement may still be prevented. In a retreat of which I was a part of back in 1936 in the Blue Army, where there were lay apostles around the country. All Marian apostles came for that retreat. And I gave a conference, two conferences on that occasion. But he said the chastisement can be prevented to a certain extent. And I'm going to quote. He says, I believe the chastisement can still be prevented. Uh, this is, I'm quoting Dr. Tom Petrisco now, who's uh, commenting on that. Asserted by John Hafner, 1996, the Lay Apostle Foundation Retreat, Washington Town, New Jersey. Hafner's confidence in God comes from more than just his belief that Mary's triumph cannot be called such uh, if a great part of humanity is annihilated. Rather, he explicitly notes that the sun, during the great miracle, October 13, 1917, at Fatima, returned to his position in the sky at the last moment when thousands believed it was about to strike the earth. So, Hafford argues 
This was a sign that someday, at a decisive moment, God will spare his people from a great suffering. And many believe that someday is approaching fast. This appears to be what Mary is also saying. I'm quoting Dr. Petrisco now. Her victory is near and will come, and like centuries before, it will come through her direct intercession. But what still needs to be done is a great amount of prayer, along with consistent, generous acts of reparation by God's people. Thus it appears that Our Lady is in need of a great outpouring of rosaries, for it is through the rosary, Mary exhorts, that she will bring the world into the era of peace. And it is through the rosary she unequivocally emphasizes that she can, quote, prevent, and again, quote, the annihilation of nations. Therefore, both of Fatima's remaining prophecies can be understood to be inescapably tied to the rosary. Now, that's an important thought there, because we're getting messages, and they're not being qualified to any extent except there's punishment, punishment, punishment. And yet our lady did say, though, no, prayer and fasting can stop wars, can prevent natural disasters. In a couple moments we're going to prove that. It's already happening. Here is some evidence to that effect. From 1950 on, there are signs that our Blessed Mother wants to prevent the world from destroying itself through nuclear wars. August 29th at Hiroshima, 1945, Four Jesuit priests were at the center of the atomic bomb explosion, but were not harmed. They witnessed afterwards that it was due to the Fatima prayers, especially the rosary they were saying at that time. The same blessing happened in Nagasaki, where a group of friars were at the center of the atomic bomb explosion, and they also were saying the, the Fatima prayers. They suffered no radiation effects. August 15th, the Assumption of Our Lady, after 11 days of bombing, the Church of Our Lady's Assumption, the priests and the Church survived. May 13th, 1955, the Soviet Army departed from Austria. It was the anniversary of the first apparition of Fatima. But this happened because 70,000 Austrians agreed to pray the rosary for that. October 12th to the 14th, three days, 1960, Khrushchev at the United Nations, maybe you remember that, mm -hmm. on TV, he took his shoe off and he pounded the podium and he said, I will bury you. Mm -hmm. All right, now listen to what happened. Pope John the 23rd had opened and read the third Fatima secret given to Sister Lucy. He authorized the Bishop of Laivia Fatima to write to all the bishops of the world, inviting them to join with the pilgrims of Fatima on the night of October 12, 13, in prayer, penance for Russia's conversion and consequent world peace. On the night of October 12, 13, about a million pilgrims spent the night outdoors in the Kova de Ira at Fatima in prayer and penance before the Blessed Sacrament. They prayed and washed despite a penetrating rain which chilled them to the bone. At the same time, at least 300 dioceses throughout the world joined with them. Pope John XXIII sent a special blessing to all taking part in this unprecedented night of reparation. On the night between October 12 and 13, right after his shoe pounding podium event, Khrushchev suddenly pulled up stakes and took a plane in all haste for Moscow canceling all subsequent engagements. Why? Marshal Nedelin, the best minds in Russia on nuclear energy, several government officials were present for the final testing of the missile that was going to be presented to Khrushchev. When countdown was completed, the missile for some reason or other did not leave the launch pad. After 15 or 20 minutes, Nedelin and all the others came out of the shelter. When they did, the missile exploded, killing over 300 people. This set back Russia's nuclear program 20 years, prevented all-out atomic warfare, the burying of the U.S. 
and this happened on the night when the whole Catholic world was on its knees before the Blessed Sacrament, gathering at the feet of our Rosary, Queen of Infatima. Our Lady does not want nuclear war. Another event, 1968. The French tested an atomic bomb in the Pacific. Pictures of the explosion at the center of the mushroom, and you probably saw that, showed clearly the image of Jesus crucified on the cross, and to, the, to his right was an image of Our Lady glowing in all white silhouette, clearly visible. How many saw that? I did. It was in Newsweek. Now the message is clear. Our Lady does not want nuclear war, and she's doing something about it. From 1980 on, there are many signs that Our Lady wants to prevent the world from destroying itself and bring peace that she promised at Fatima. May 13, 1983, one of the greatest crowds that ever came to Fatima to celebrate the anniversary of Mary's first apparition and to pray the rosary. That day, a massive explosion destroyed two-thirds of the nuclear air and ship-to-ship -ship missiles of the Soviet Union's most powerful fleet. It was called by news reporters to be the greatest disaster to occur in the Soviet Na Navy since World War II. Sister Lucia said a nuclear war would have occurred in 1985 if that didn't happen. May 12, 1988, the Soviet missile motor plant exploded. I have a quote on that. Four years later, it happened again, in other words, as thousands prayed all night long on May 12, 1988, during the vigil of the anniversary of Prishna Fatima, another major explosion shut down the Soviet Union's sole missile motor plant. The Associated Press reported a major explosion has shut down the only plant in the Soviet Union that makes the main rocket motors that the country's newest long-range nuclear missiles, and according to U.S. officials. The Pentagon released a statement noting the accident occurred on May 12, destroyed several buildings and a Soviet propellant plant in Paolo Grian. Curiously, just a week before, May 3, 1988, a similar eruption ripped apart a Nevada facility believed to be handling the ammonium percolate used in the main rocket motors for the SS-24 missile. July 3, 1987. Mary spoke to Stefano Gobi, saying, Already during this Marian year, certain great events will take place concerning what I predicted in Fatima and here again, I have a good quote. Five months later, the world events confirmed Mary's words. Soviet President Gorbachev came to the United States and signed a peace accord. It was December the 8th, the Peace of the Immaculate Conception. Sometime later, President Reagan wrote to Father John Villanova, a chaplain of the Sanctuary of Fatima, Portugal, thanking him for having sent the pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima to the White House. Did you know that? I didn't. It was, said Regan, quote, upstairs in Nancy's and my bedroom at the White House when he and Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev were downstairs below signing the <coughs> peace treaty. In 1991, eight hardline communists attempted to overthrow President Gorbachev. You remember reading that, okay? That was also written up very well in the Reader's Digest. I remember reading that. You probably recall that. Uh, here's what happened. The attempted coup was denounced and defeated, and consequently the communists were not permitted to regain power in Russia. They kidnapped him and had him under house arrest. But that's all that could happen. In the meantime, though, in 1987, here's what happened. The Virgin Mary appeared at Khrushchev in the Ukraine, and a longtime Catholic underground dissident named Joseph Terenia with a rosary in her right hand and the Christ child on her left, Mary gave Joseph messages which foretold the future. Two years later, in 1989, Terenia received a powerful dream which described and predicted almost to the letter the coming coup in 1991. He said, I saw a map of the Ukraine and the bloody river began to dry up. 
the earth in many places was scorched and took on a black-gray color. This was the color of death. But amid the black-gray ashes I saw grass sprouting. It was all very tall. I saw the people kneeling and crying, but I knew these were tears of joy and salvation. I saw the new Babylon, the red city, that was falling into the earth. And that city, under a Christian temple, was a secret hiding place. There were eight men there, eight rulers, all eight waxen yellow. They laughed horribly and bared their teeth. Gorbachev told me it wasn't he who was in charge of the state. I saw the real leader of the USSR behind a yellow screen. It was Lucifer himself. So I think many of our people didn't know this. But these are spiritual events, okay? But they're not disassociated from world events. But now, getting back to September the 12th, 1991, to Father Gobi in Slovakia, about the collapse of communism. Our Lady said, This is my work alone, and I myself am furthering it in every part of the world, because these are the times of my triumph, of my victory, of your salvation. In the name of Mary, Marxist communism, which for decades has been exercising its rule and holding so many of my poor children in oppressive, bloody slavery, has been defeated in these countries, not because of political movements or persons, but through my personal intervention has your liberation finally come about. Well, what conclusions can we make? These are not just coincidences. There are too many of them, okay? Too many things happening at the same time. From all these signs and events and Mary's messages, we can conclude that our Blessed Lady is winning her war with Satan. And she says that she is winning it by the power of the Rosary. It will be the power that will bring the final victory foretold at Fatima. At this point, I want to include all the messages we have from this beautiful work called Mary Speaks to Her Beloved Priests. And there are at least five chapters that are just marvelous on how important the Rosary is and what Our Lady says about that. On the Feast of the Rosary, by the way, given back in 1979, Our Lady had this to say, By this prayer, meaning the Rosary, you offer your Heavenly Mother a powerful force for intervening for the salvation of many of my poor straying children. Your entire rosary is like an immense chain of love and salvation with which you are able to encircle persons and situations and even influence all the events of your time. Listen to that. 1979, and you had messages earlier, 1980, 88, 90, 91. She said this a long time ago. Notice that? That means all over the world, geographically, politically, socially, whatever. Diseases. Now she continues, I want to intervene as a mother to shorten the time of the trial and to comfort you in the sufferings which await you. We've been through this. Everything can still be changed if you, my children, continue with greater generosity and perseverance in the recitation of the Rosary. We saw that confirmed. The Rosary is the prayer which I myself came down from heaven to ask of you. You are able by it to lay bare the plots of my adversary, escape from many of his deceits, defend yourselves from many dangers which he puts in your way. It preserves you from evil, brings you ever closer to me. Now let's look at each of those sections to lay bare the plots of my adversary. We know all over the world Satan is making his plans. We know that the po politicians of the world are being used by Satan. They want to have what? The one card, the one food chain that's already set up. Look at the currency. In Europe now, Europe. one currency. Yes. Okay? The Lord knows all this. And here Our Lady is saying, you're able to lay bare the plots. See? And also, escape from many of his deceits. He's trying to snare us in different ways. And we're, Our Lady is enlightening different people knowledgeable 
to reveal what they're doing. Like this uh, printout I gave you on the smart card and the the chip that I gave you some time ago, there's the plot. Notice that being revealed. The many deceits. You defend yourselves from many dangers which he puts in your way. All kinds of things can happen. Uh, accidents, uh, we don't know just how, what's behind that. Also, preserves you from evil and brings you ever closer to me. Evil means all kinds of things that are not good, but brings you ever closer to me. It means Our Lady's shield of protection is around us. Now she ends that chapter with, The Church will be defended and saved by its victorious mother through the power which comes to me from you by means of the frequent recitation of the Holy Rosary. How much clearer could she make that? The Church will be defended. We're praying for the Holy Father, praying for our priests, bishops, and cardinals. The Church will be defended, saved, through the power, notice that, that comes to me from you through the Rosary. She's going to say more about that as we go into this. The title of this, The Dragon Will Be Shackled, meaning Satan. She said, It's necessary for you to employ a weapon which is both secure and invincible. This weapon is your prayer. And she's going to say the rosary. Notice that? She will say later on, it's the rosary. Now she continues by saying, <clears throat> Especially you can free an immense number of souls whom Satan has succeeded in imprisoning. Prayer possesses a potent force and starts a chain reaction in good that is far more powerful than any atomic reaction. Notice how she brings a nuclear power. It can free an immense number of souls from Satan who succeeded in imprisoning them. Prayer possesses a potent force, starts a chain reaction. Notice that in good, like a wave. Have you notice that? Throw a stone in a lake. It starts a ripple, and watch it. It doesn't stop until it reaches the shore. It keeps on moving, moving, moving until something stops it, the shore. So then a wave of goodness starts. First thing you know, it's moving on and on. Prayer of The prayer of my predilection, in other words, the prayer I love most, she said, is the Holy Rosary. I unite myself with those who say it. I request it from all with solicitude and maternal preoccupation, means maternal concern. So when we say the rosary, should have that impression. You're not just saying it alone. That's another thing, too, when we talk about the divine will, by the way. Here's to make it more meaningful, right? Jesus said, I do with you whatever you're doing. So when you're praying, I pray with you, all right? So he does pray with us, but we're in his divine will. We're with him where? everywhere because he is keeping everybody alive. So he said, in prayer you join me then with everybody. Who? All the millions who are saying the rosary. How about all the millions who are not saying the rosary? And we can say, Lord, I will substitute my rosary for the six billion people who are in the world, as many as do not have the rosary, as if they too were saying it. How about that? If you want to say a powerful rosary, remember Jesus said, if one prays, but in my will, they do as much as ten, if they pray for ten, or a hundred, if a hundred, or a thousand. Remember that expression we had some time ago? Yes. He said, I make up for it. Why not make it as powerful as we can? And here's where insights from the divine will do help a lot in your prayer life. How about that? Now, Our Lady also says this then, Satan's pride will again be conquered by the humility of little ones, and the red dragon will find himself decisively humiliated and defeated when I bind him, not by a great chain, but by a very frail cord, the Holy Rosary. Isn't that humiliating? Now, that's, that's, that makes sense in God's terms. See, he deserves it, and he's going to get clobbered. She said, it is a prayer that you say together with me. 
When you invite me to pray for you, I accede to your request and mingle my voice with yours, and I unite my prayer to yours. These are all insights on how to make your rosary more meaningful to you. See, rather than just mumbling words, saying it alone, you're not alone. A blessed mother is there. Use different images. If you're kneeling, imagine she's right in front of you and your hands are on her knees and you're looking up into her face. I once told that to nuns and I heard him say, Oh, you know, it's a beautiful way to pray. Why not use the imagination? And she said, Consequently, it becomes more and more efficacious because your heavenly mother is suppliant omnipotence. Mother means all-powerful. Prayerful all-powerfulness. What I ask for, I always obtain, because Jesus can never say no to what his mother requests of him. And we always knew that. But here's what she's saying. In the rosary, you become formed for the perfect glory of the Father with the frequent repetition of the prayer Jesus taught you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That's as far as she goes in the prayer, but she reminds us of the entire prayer. And it's more relevant to us, us as we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I ask you to make use of the Holy Rosary as the most efficacious weapon for fighting in the great battle under the command of, quote, the, the Book of Revelations, the woman clothed with the sun. Multiply your cynicals of prayer and fraternity. Consecrate yourselves to my Immaculate Heart. Frequently recite the Holy Rosary. Then the powerful red dragon will be shackled by this chain, and his margin of action will become ever more restricted. In the end, he will be left impotent and harmless, powerless, in other words. So there's another meaning to your rosary. Every time you say it, it's like putting a chain around Satan. And by the way, that can refer to loved ones who've left the church, left their Christian practice, and they're what? They're open game for Satan. So you can restrict him. You can also keep them in mind like that, for that purpose. Now, look what she says, especially about Satan. See, she's in command. She's already putting the chain around him, but how is she doing that? With millions of rosaries. And Satan doesn't like that. But we are gleeful. Every time you do that, swing the whip, the chain, and the rosary. Our Lady says, The rosary brings you to peace. If you allow yourselves to be led with docility by me, you will always feel at your side the precious help which is given you by the angels of the Lord, the blessed and the saints of paradise, and all the souls who are still being purified in purgatory. And she's, of course, referring to our time of prayer. I want to add a thought here that she has. She says, she's talking about Pope John Paul and his battle against the, the spirits of evil and trying to keep the Christian church uh, safe. And he tells us, He is already announcing to you my sure victory. Follow him along the road which he points out. If you wish to prepare with me a new and radiant Pentecost, for the whole church. And then she adds here, to fight and conquer all this evil, which is attempting to submerge the entire human race, you must have recourse to the powerful weapon of prayer. And so it is necessary to ask for this gift through a continual, incessant, and trusting prayer. And of course, what is that? The rosary. She says, pray with me. Invoke with your heavenly mother a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit which will lead it to live the experience of a second and radiant Pentecost. That's another aspect of your prayer in the Rosary. It's going to bring about what she calls the second Pentecost. Pray above all with the prayer of the Holy Rosary. Let the Rosary be for everyone the powerful weapon to be made use of in these times. The Rosary brings you peace. With this prayer, you are able to obtain from the Lord the great grace of a change of hearts, of the conversion of souls, of the return of all humanity to God, along the road of repentance, of love, of divine grace, of holiness. Now there's a paragraph that needs some explaining. You're able to obtain from the Lord the grace 
of a change of heart. That means conversion. How many parents and just friends, relatives, family are praying for wayward members? Change of heart. Also, conversion of souls, that's along the same lines. Change of heart. And also, the return of all humanity to God. So we're not just praying for a few people. We can pray for all the countries like the Mohammedan world, the Hindu world, the Buddhist world, that's China, and East Asia, and all that, billions over there, and Melanesia, the, the islands there to have something like 200 billion people, all those islands. Now bring along the road of repentance, love, divine grace, and holiness. She's saying, in other words, it is a special means of bringing God's power and all his blessings upon mankind. She breaks it down, yes. She says, each day in silence, in hiddenness. Now what does that mean? All of you at home. Who's going to praise you? Who's going to see you saying quietly your rosary? Who's going to say, that's great, you're doing wonders? Nobody's there. See? In hiddenness, silence. The Heavenly Mother is waging her battle against the adversary and is working by means of the most extraordinary signs and manifestations to change the heart of the world. All those silent rosaries that you and I and millions of others are saying, and grandmothers and people and I've sat on the plane, grandmothers sitting beside me, quietly her beads going through her fingers, you know, all over the world, our lady is saying, your heavenly mother is waging her battle against the adversary and is working by the most extraordinary signs and manifestations. We heard about them, Khrushchev, the explosions, okay, to change the heart of the world. That means all the peoples in the world, countries. All right, so let's move on. The angel with the key and the chain. Here again, our lady is saying what she already said before, but in a new setting. The rosary is my prayer. It is the prayer which I came down from heaven to ask of you because it is the weapon with which you must make use of in these times of great battle. And it is the sign of my assured victory. So every rosary you're saying is making its mark. My victory will be won when Satan with his powerful army made up of all the infernal spirits will be shut up within his kingdom of darkness and death from which he will no longer be able to escape to harm the world. There is to come down from heaven for this reason an angel to whom there is given the key of the abyss and a chain with which this angel will bind the great dragon, the ancient serpent Satan, with all of his followers. I am the queen of the angels, because it is of the very nature of my role to be sent by the Lord to accomplish the very great and important mission of conquering Satan. The key with which it is possible to open and shut the door to the abyss has been given to me. The key is the sign of the power which belongs to him who is Lord and master of a place which belongs to him. And of course she's saying it is Jesus Christ. He is the master and king of all the universe, namely of heaven, earth, and of the abyss. My son Jesus alone possesses the key of the abyss because he himself is the key of David. Jesus consigns this key, which represents his divine power, into my hands. Because as his mother, mediatrix between you and my son, there is entrusted to me the task of conquering Satan and all his powerful army of evil. The chain with which this great dragon is to be bound is made up of prayer, made with me and by means of me. This prayer is the Holy Rosary. The chain has, in fact, the function first of all limiting action, then of imprisoning, and finally of making ineffective every activity of the one who has been bound by it. The chain of the Holy Rosary has first of all the function of limiting the action of my adversary. This is important. Every rosary which you recite with me has the effect of restricting the action of the evil one, of drawing souls away from his pernicious influence, of giving great impetus the expansion of goodness in the life of many of my children. The chain of the Holy Rosary has also the effect of imprisoning Satan, that is, of making his action powerless, and of diminishing 
weakening more and more the force of his diabolical power. So each rosary, recited well, deals a mighty blow to the power of evil, and it represents one part of his reign which is destroyed. So nobody, no matter how small or how old or how few there are, uh, have a power over Satan. One of the last things he would want then is the rosary to be said. So whatever you forget, say it. Sometimes I've been busy and it's about 12 o'clock midnight before I got time to say the rosary. Say it. The chain of the Holy Rosary brings about in the end the result of making Satan completely harmless. His great power is destroyed. All the evil spirits are cast into the pool of fire and sulfur. The door is shut by me with the key of the power of Christ, and thus they will no longer be able to go out into the world to do harm to souls. Now you understand why I am asking you to multiply everywhere the cynicals of prayer with the recitation of the Holy Rosary, meditation on my word, and your consecration to my Immaculate Heart. The humble, fragile cord of the Holy Rosary forms the strong chain with which I will take as my prisoner the dark ruler of the world, the enemy of God and of his faithful servants. So the pride of Satan will once again be defeated by the power of the little, the humble and the poor. As I announce to you today that this, my great victory, is near at hand the victory which will bring you to your assured liberation. I will give you the comfort of my motherly presence among you." So what is that telling you about, well, it's a chastisement and so forth, and here's what our saying is that is the victory is near at hand. How will all the signs mentioned come into effect? That's where the modification comes in. Many of the punishments may be entirely removed with a minimum of chastisement. But we can't minimize what the Lord wants to do. In other words, if He wants to do it. But it's His wisdom and love and mercy that often modify His justice. See? Can one man satisfy God's justice? Yes, it can. But God is the one to choose that as a measure. See? He might require far more. That's God has that right to do that. But each Mass has, is infinite in its value. I mean, there's no limit to its blessing. But we can place yeah, limits on it to us. So the, uh, the power of the Rosary cannot be underestimated because it, in other words, give our Blessed Mother the opportunity to use her power given her by Jesus to influence everything that's happening in the world today. And so don't place a small value on your Rosary, as you say it. Okay. Then let us move on to the next text. Here Our Lady is talking about inordinate activity, not giving time to prayer, talking about the dangers in our spiritual life. Another danger which threatens you is that of allowing yourself to be taken up with inordinate activity and so forgetting the powerful force which prayer has in obtaining the grace of conversion for many of my poor sinful children. And so I've invited you to pray much for the conversion of sinners by showing you through my little daughter Bernadette that the most efficacious prayer, the prayer which is most preferred by me, is that of the Holy Rosary. She does say a few things there about uh, the chapter that we're discussing here has what Our Lady calls the dangers which threaten you. And she enumerates a number of them, and this is one. But she says, lastly, there is a continual danger of falling ill, of allowing our, yourself to be seized by discouragement and lack of confidence, thus reducing you to a true spiritual powerlessness. And so I have wished also to manifest myself as a medicine for your ills, a help in your needs, a support in your human weakness. And how? Through the rosary. This was delivered on May 1st. And the title of it is The Hour of Calvary. The rosary which you recite has a very great power against evil and against the numerous enticements of my adversary. To the reign of Satan which is spreading 
to the slavery of sin which is subjugating many of my children, to evil which is instilling its venom in hearts, to the snares of the evil one which have become subtle and dangerous, to the powerful force of Freemasonry which has succeeded in insinuating itself everywhere, to the cult of Satan which is spreading, respond with the prayer of the Holy Rosary. This is my prayer. It is your prayer. Again, note the occasions she mentions here. Against evil and against numerous enticements of the spirit of evil. Then she mentions the evil which is instilling its venom in, in the hearts of the people. Do you know it's by means of television that a lot of this is done? When we least suspect it, through the ads, and if we're careless about what we watch, unless you monitor it, then you're going to have something inserted into your mind through what you see. And Satan is gearing up all this. These people out there to make money, those are along his lines, covetousness, greed, see? And they'll use all types of motivation. And to the snares of evil which have become subtle and dangerous, through all the media, all things that we read, through the eye, through what you hear, and the powerful force of Freemasonry. The reason why it has succeeded so long is it's been hidden. See, the less you know of it, the more, the more powerful they are. They are a screen, but they're like a net. If you break one part of the net, like a fish net, all the rest binds together. They're all tied together in little squares. Break a little square, that's the only thing that's hurt. But they have so many t tentacles out. Cut one off, you've got 50 others. See? And through all of them, they manage to work evil in the world. It's been said that Freemasonry caused communism. And, of course, atheism. See? They have unlimited power, unlimited money, resources. I know the Lord wants us to be detached because we have so many things in our world today that are making life luxurious and uh, over... Um, hedonistic, in other words, pleasures of all kinds, that they're like a glue that sticks to you, that we, unless we get rid of it, it's going to stand in the way of a complete detachment. We, In other words, we belong, should belong entirely to the Lord. There should be no attachments that we cannot let go. And so the Lord's going to deal with all of that. He's already de do, doing that in places where they have a radical destruction. The floods as far back as, what, four or five years ago, six states were involved. How many homes completely gone? Yes. You know, people in their whole lives. Not that we wish that, but the Lord is saying, am I first in your life, or what is it? See? Is that really God's will? It's His permissive will. Permissive. He allowed it in order to, what, I think a lot of people turned to God maybe didn't before. Yes. Yes. Uh, so many people who you see on television who lost their their homes and everything they owned said, um, I I saw that they said that, but we're alive and still have our life, and mm -hmm. they just let go of everything. Yeah. See, they learn how many things are cluttering up their life, yeah, yeah. and only and they didn't have the courage. Well, who of us has the courage to say, I'm going to leave my home and everything. I'm going to go to Alaska and, uh, uh -huh. and go to cabin up there. <laughs> Now, we, we should feel that for them. In other words, it would be insensitive to talk heartlessly about their suffering that way. In other words, they deserve it and whatever. Where are we to judge? We leave it to the Lord. And some of the, even some of the churches, what happened uh, was that some time ago, even the churches were gone in that tornado. That's right. Yeah. That 300-mile-an-hour tornado, yeah. you know, even the churches were gone. See, they're just brick buildings. How about the one in Italy, St. Francis of Assisi? Yeah, that oh, was, they had to restore good. that. Yes. Father, it reminds me of the scripture that says, uh, God lets the rain to fall on the good and the bad alike. That's yeah. That's like the tornadoes, the good as well as the... Well, look at the war. The good and the bad yeah. suffered. Right. Remember the story I told you about the nuns, the convent of 60 nuns in Dresden, when uh, uh, Churchill authorized pattern bombing? Do you know what that means? 
kill everybody in there. So you get the factory, but everybody. That meant the poor, the innocent, and the children, and the, and the wives, and whatever, and anybody. Well, this convent was bombed. And when they came into the city looking for living people, they walked into the chapel, and there, kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament, were sixty nuns dead. All died in that bombing. So the good and the bad. See? See, nuns? It's like uh, the martyrdoms of the early Christians. They were fed to the wolves. Children were dressed as sheep so that the animals would eat them. Now, horrible. Yes? But, Father, that, that's not a punishment for them because they're with God. Right? They're going to heaven. Yes. Right. Martyrdom is considered the greatest act of love. That's right. Heroic. They're automatically saints. Church but canonized I them. Understand. Fair. Yes. Father, is the church guilty of um, having too many beautiful gold and, you know... It's been said about the treasures of the Vatican that they could be sold and given to the poor. Yeah. And there have been arguments back and forth on that. Yes, and then the many of the cathedrals in the, around the city have, you know, their arts just to look at. Yeah. They are a museum. But actually, Father, they're, they're priceless. Who could afford to buy them? Who could they sell them to? But there are people... Yeah. But these people want to have these just to admire them for their own pleasure. But there are people like that, you know. Any question on this? Um, before, we used to say, um, I am with you, the two or three of heaven, I am in your midst. Now, if you're alone, you're not alone because you've got the first mother with you. You've got a guardian angel with you. Yeah. And we have the Divine Presence, Father, Son, and Holy Way. Three. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you got a lot of company. Oh, by the way, you've got your patent saint. Yeah. Prayer. All in prayer. If we all pray, can cigarettes be eliminated? Yes, she said. Situations. It refers to everything on earth. How about the drug for the young? Okay. So whatever, whatever you're thinking of, that can also change those situations, okay? So nothing is too small, in other words, to include in our petitions, all right? Father, what about the group rosary? I mean, I was all, like, to promote a rosary, I thought that was always such a good thing. And to stay in a group, in, like, in church, is that, is it uh, still... Oh, that's better than just one person, of course. Yes, always. We always say there for the mass. Yeah. Well, doesn't it have the power of the as many people are saying there instead of like you say by yourself, it's one rosary. If you're saying it with eight people, it has the power of eight people. Yes, it's better than one person unless they're a saint. Their yeah, faith might be better than a hundred other people. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But the faith of a hundred people put together can be tremendous. Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. So we should, in other words have what we call family rosary, a group rosary, and uh, and that's what we call the family or communion of prayer. Yes. Any other question? You know, I saw that, um, like in the morning, and I turn on Mother Angelica's child, uh, channel, and <laughs> Father Mitch Pacwa says the, the rosary, and he has, like, it's in the Holy Land, and he has this whole pilgrim, pilgrimage. Now, God is, is a respecter of no place or no time, so would all of those people reciting the rosary then in this pilgrimage be united with the rosary that Absolutely. I say alone? Wherever in the world they're saying a rosary, we're one with them. In other words, and also the wish. Some years ago in my book, Prayer of Love, The Art of Aspiration, I quoted John Tower, the Dominican, who said, God takes the wish for the deed. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to say, Lord, even though there may be five million, but I know there are six billion people on earth, I would wish, Lord, that on the lips of all these six billion, in every hand there would be a rosary as I am saying my rosary. Please accept this. Leave it up to the Lord. And he take the wish. How about six billion rosaries being said today? 
What do you think will happen? It's confirmed what I was going to say to you when you said, Claire, See? about Father Mitch with the rosary. I say it with the, this is on Mother and John, Ethan right. and Tien. Then at 3 o'clock is the chaplet, and, the, and not on 25, just on my dish. And at 3.30 you the rosary again. And then 9.30 at night is the rosary again. Mm-hmm. And ne- yes, nice. so I have it on blasting. Mm-hmm. He's in his bedroom. He can hear it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have it blasting because, <laughs> you know, he's prayerful. But, uh, you know, he's too proud yeah. to say, yeah, I'm praying, uh-huh. you know. All right. He has no choice. <laughs> he has no choice. He's going to get prayed by us, <laughs> It's buried in the walls. The walls are resounding with, he, with he prayer. But he never tells me to turn anything <clears throat> off that's on that. All right. Well, that's along the lines we're saying. In other words, God takes the wish for the deed. Grace is being poured on us that we take things for granted lots of times. Mm-hmm. And we should really be more thankful yeah. for what's happening. And I believe in miracles, too. Well, enough people don't believe in miracles, consequently we don't have them. Mm-hmm. See, that's one reason why the Lord said, the reason there are not enough miracles is people do not believe. Yeah. Yes. And I just received from uh, Michael Scanlon, Father Michael from Steubenville, Mm -hmm. the thing he wrote on, even priests don't believe in miracles. Sure, I've heard that. He sent me four four of them, long copies, so I'm going to give one to our church. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one the next time we get together. He sent me four of them because he did a beautiful, you know, uh, talk on Miracles are happening every day, mm-hmm. and lay people have to be told what the miracles are in their lives when they share with a priest or with another lay person. We all have these miracles, but you have to see it and know it, you know, with the wisdom and knowledge that you're teaching today. Right, yeah. Well, just look at the Eucharist now. How about the appearances of the blood in the host, right. the chalice? There's more of that happening. See? And the Lord is saying, this is the greatest miracle of all. I want to prove that I'm really there. Okay. 